Let's keep reading Kenny and the Dragon. We are up to chapter 7. Imminent extermination. The gold-hilted sword sh shimmered in the morning light as George swiped the air with the weapon. The knight went through a series of attack motions, then stopped, a bit winded, and grinned at Kenny. The Riverstone's stomach finally pushed the, bre the, the, what? the breath out of the boy. Dizzy and lightheaded, he dropped his mug on the chessboard, drowning the pieces in a fizzy brown deluge. In a blink, George dropped the sword and caught Kenny as the lad was about to topple backwards off his stool. Little squire, he cried as he helped Kenny up. Are you okay? The young rabbit caught his breath and his eyes slowly focused on the kindly, brave face of George. This codger was certainly not at all what he expected. He was a knight, a royal guardsman and a dragon slayer. And if the stories George had shared with him over the years were even half true, then he had to warn Graham immediately. I've got to go, Kenny said as he headed for the door. The knight stopped him. But you just got here and are you OK? Is it? George paused, kneeling down to look the lad in the eyes. Are you worried about me? Because you don't have to be, son. Once I get suited up and on the, that hilltop, this monster will be slain in moments. I know how to handle these devils. You can even watch or help if your parents allow it. It was too much for the lad. Kenny dashed out of the shop without even saying goodbye. He pedalled as fast as his legs could go from the, from the centre of town. His mind was so full of worry that he didn't even notice that the crowd was now much larger than it had been previously. In fact, villages were lighting up on either side of the street. George had been his hope. His only hope. His only hope of figuring out what to do with the dragon. If there was anyone in the village, outside of his family, who would understand Graham's, Graham wasn't a threat, it would have been George. And now he was preparing to come up and slay his best friend. And with orders from the king himself. How could he not follow them? Then his mind flashed to the newspaper headline and what the paper boy had said. Was this mess somehow all his fault? Had he verified old Pope's story by declaring what a real dragon was like during his book report? As he pedalled even faster, the gears in Kenny's mind clicked and whirred, trying to find a solution for his friend. Perhaps Graham could hide out in his cave for a little while until this blows over, he said, thinking out loud. I bet Mum and Dad would let him live in our barn if he had to even though it is a little tight. He was almost to the top of Shepherd's Hill now. Graham will know what to do, he said as he hopped off his bike. He found the dragon examining himself in an old full-length mirror, rubbing something onto his skin with a tattered flannel shirt. <clears throat> Kenny, have a look at this, he said with that familiar toothy grin. Your mum gave me some floor wax that polishes my scales up nicely. Look at this sheen. It really brings out the iridescence in my complexion. Kenny was panting, completely out of breath. Graham, you have to go. George is coming to fight you. George is coming to what? Why? What's he upset with me for? I didn't damage one single page of his books. OK, well, I did scorch that cover of that silly bestiary a little, but it totally had me in stitches. Honestly, I don't know where some writers get their crazy ideas from. A camelopard of all the... Graham, Kenny interrupted. He's a knight, a dragon slayer who works for the king. The drake hissed, looked at the young rabbit for a second, then reassure, resumed polishing his scales though in a much more frenetic fashion. I thought he was your friend. I thought we had a lot in common, a fellow book lover. 
a fellow connoisseur of the finer things in life, not some courtly bane sent for my imminent for my imminent extermination. He threw the rag down on the ground, walked towards his cave entrance and began tidying. He's not like that, Kenny squeaked as he followed the dragon. Kindly old George had been his friend for as long as he could remember. He's a good guy. He taught me how to play chess and he introduced me to all these good books you're, we've been enjoying. The dragon kept his back turned to the lad. Kenny's heart started beating faster and faster. What are we going to do? he asked. I am not going to do anything, the dragon replied in an icy tone. As I told you before, that was the sport of all my brethren, not me. That's why I'm still here today, and they are all gone. Slain by knights like your good friend George. You tell him there will be no battle between us. No bloody Roman holiday. I won't have it. He has orders from the king himself, Kenny pleaded. For the whole town is gathering for this. King Schming, Graham turned to face the boy. His eyes were glowing and wisps of smoke were rising out of his nostrils. What does he know? When was the last time he sat down and talked to a dragon? Instead, the cadger sends some carking valet up here to do the dirty deed, without even a, hello, how are you today? Mind if I cut your throat? Graham calmed down, picked up his rag and began polishing himself again. Now, if George wants to come up for some ginger beer and a good game of chess, well, then I'd be quite happy to see him and let his shady past stay where it belongs. But no weapons or pointy things that he can stick, hurl or jab me with. Kenny slumped his shoulders and looked down. I'm afraid it's not going to happen that way. Little bantling, said Graham with a sigh as he stopped admiring himself in the mirror. He bent low enough to look Kenny right in the eyes. Don't worry. I just know you will think of something to make this right. Come on now. You're a well-read smart one, remember? Flabbergasted, Kenny said nothing. The dragon resumed polishing his scales and admiring himself in the mirror, as if he was without a care. Sorry. As if he was without a care in the world. His mind whirling, Kenny grabbed his bicycle and left. Normally, the arduous ride up Shepherd's Hill meant a fast-paced exiting ride down, but the boy simply walked his bike back toward home. The high noon sun had warmed the soft ground, and there was a gentle, lazy breeze whispering through the leaves as, he's made, as he made his way down the hill. Dragonflies and butterflies flitted all above. One even alighted on his handlebars, but Kenny didn't notice any of this. What on earth am I going to do, he said to himself. Both of his best friends were to be pitted against each other in a battle to the death. Who would win? Would Graham just lie there, refusing to fight and be slaughtered? Or would George, much older now than he was back in his heyday, be burnt to a crisp? The river stone feeling had taken over his entire body, and he swallowed hard to hold back the river itself that welled up in his eyes. Parking his bike on the porch, he was startled by his father bursting out of the front door. Kit, hurry boy, you're just in time, his dad exclaimed. His mother strolled out of the house behind him, tying a kerchief around her head. Well, what's going on? Where are we going? Kenny replied. For a moment, his parents' excitement distracted him from the heavy responsibility he was feeling. There's a parade in town. We just got word, his mum answered as she hopped aboard their sheep-drawn cart. It's supposed to be quite a procession. Your father hasn't been this excited since... since... Since you made that apple crumble pie for my birthday. Now come on, son, his dad said, slapping the spot right next to him on the driver's bench. I'll even let you drive. You don't understand, Kenny said. Why do you think they're even having a parade? Both his parents blinked and looked at each other. An early celebration of an annual con co corn cob festival, his mum guessed, though it sounded more like she was asking the question. Pig wrestling, his dad added, also in, a, in a, an I'm... I'm not so sure that it, is this a trick question sort of a way. You guys haven't been in town for a while, said Kenny. This is all about Graham. I'm sure of it. Really? His father replied. I don't know about that. And he paused for a moment, mulling it over. What would the parade be for? Why don't we go into town and see for ourselves, his mother suggested. 
Kenny sighed and slowly climbed up onto the cart with his parents. It seemed that as much as he might try to escape it, he found himself heading right back into Roundbrook and right back into his worst fears. Chapter 8. George Owl Slayer So, it turns out that George really was a royal knight. I suppose that truly does make this a fairy tale, for one cannot conjure up an image of dragons without thinking of brave knights and impudent kings. These days, however, there are not too many stories of this sort left, and many involve much darkness before their happy ending. So we must march on and see what it is, what it is in store for our little lad, Kenny. Kenny squinted as George, who shone from head to toe in golden fluted armour. He was astride his brilliant white mount, which was adorned in rich fabrics and tassels. In one gauntleted hand, he carried a large shield with a fierce dragon etched into it. In the other, he held a long lance with a faded royal standard hanging from its pointed tip. People had turned out from all over. Some had even travelled in from as far as Meadow Falls. The streets were jammed with zealous townsfolk, yelling and waving brightly coloured banners with the word George painted on one side and Dragon Slayer on the other. From the rooftops, revellers threw flower petals down to the gallant knight, gallant knight below. Ladies swooned and trumpets and horns blared as the procession began its march down the cobblestone streets. George our slayer! George our saint! The chant from the crowd rang out through the air. Kenny felt dizzy. His mother and father were confused. Wait a second. Why the heck is the bookshop owner all gussied up on a steed? His father asked aloud. His an urchin standing next to them, waving a wooden sword, sword smiled and said, That old timer there is Georgie, the knight who's going to up on that hill tomorrow and kill the vicious dragon. Kenny's father's eyes went wide. His mother put her paw to her mouth. Oh my, she cried. Both of them looked over at their son. He was completely deflated. How could this be stopped? Kenny's father knelt down in front of him. Kit, you were right. You've got to get to your pal George and tell him what's going on. Ma and I will go back and talk to Graham. It's useless, Kenny said over the din of the cheering crowd. I've already tried speaking to Graham, but he doesn't understand. The river from his stomach started burning in his eyes again. His mum put her hand on his shoulder. We'll be sure to discuss it with him over lunch. You know that a full stomach allows the brain to be hungry for common sense. We'll talk to him. They turned to go. You've got to make this right with George, son, his father said. I know you can do it. Kenny watched his parents shuffle off into the sea of rowdy, screaming villagers. His mother gave one quick, quick glance over her shoulder and nodded before they disappeared into the mass. He stood there, dazed, as the bystanders pushed and shoved their way around him, following the parade. It's no use trying to get close to George, he muttered to himself, and even if I could, he won't be able to hear me. I'm just going to have to wait this one out. As he did, and so he did, Kenny sat all afternoon and watched as the boisterous gathering cheered and led the proud, chivalrous knight clear across town and back again. As his eyes followed George trotting about on his gallant mount, Kenny thought to himself, maybe I overacted back at the shop. Maybe I should have stayed and talked to George. After all, we are good friends. It shouldn't be too hard to tell him about Graham. The procession finally stopped at the centre of town at the old Round Brook Inn, where they poured into the tavern to continue the celebration. Kenny ran into the crowd, wiggling his way through the legs and bums, and peered in through a greasy window. There was George, standing on the bar and toasting, with the townsfolk pressed all around him. He'll burn my crops for sure. You must get rid of him, one farmer yelled out. He'll sneak into our house and eat all three of my daughters, another woman cried. He'll destroy our homes, eat our livestock. You have to save us. Kill the dragon, kill the dragon, they all began to chant. How can they be, want someone killed they don't even know, Kenny said under his breath. 
How can George just blindly do whatever the king says? The river stone stomach was starting to melt away to another feeling, a fiery feeling. Good people of Roundbrook, George declared. Fear not, for you will all be safe and sound. You have my word. Now go on home to your friends, your farms, your families, and rest easy. For when the sun sets tomorrow night, this monster, this devil, this beastly scourge will be smitten from your land. Well, of course, the crowd burst into a uproarious applause as they carried the knight out of the inn on their shoulders. Bidding them all good night, George took his weapons, hopped onto his steed and headed back home. The shadows grew long, signalling the end of the busy day as the knight turned down his empty street. There he found our lad Kenny, sitting and waiting on his doorstep. Kenny, my boy, my squire, you scooted off this morning so quickly. Where on earth did you go? Are you feeling better? Kenny took George's shield and lance from him while the knight dismounted. Immediately, the lad was reminded of the night that he first met Graham. They were bidding each other farewell as the drake handed back Kenny's own makeshift weapons. Now, as he held the actual weapons, he felt the river within him was frozen. He shook it off, focusing on George, and replied, A little bit. Actually, I came back to talk to you, and... Did you see the parade? I kept an eye out for you. What a sight! What a spectacle it was! I felt... I felt like I was in the prime of my youth once again. I did, Kenny said, trying George's mount, tying George's mount to a street sign. I had just gotten back from seeing that friend of mine I was telling you about earlier. Remember? And I... Can you help me with these buckles, lad? George asked as he rushed into his shop. He poked his head back out the front door when he realised that Kenny hadn't moved. Come on, I do want to hear about your friend, but I have to tell you about tomorrow. Just give me a hand with this coat of mail, Kenny sighed, trailing behind him, arriving back in George's little home on the second floor. That's a good boy. I've mm, forgotten how hot this armour is. I haven't worn it in years, the knight said as he began to unbuckle the metallic pieces. Kenny helped his friend out of his suit of armour and sat, set the parts carefully back into the trunk. Even though the pieces were heavy and clanged while George wriggled out of them, Kenny had never seen his old pal so sprightly before. Phew, that's much better, the knight said, and went into the icebox. I'm parched. Do you want something to drink? Kenny went, went to answer, but before he could speak, the excited George handed him a bottle of birch beer and cut him off. Hold on a sec, I'll be right back. I've so much to talk to you about, and I need my... The lad heard George's voice drift away as the knight scurried back downstairs to the bookshop for something. He had to tell George about Graham. He took a big swig from his birch beer. Just take a deep breath and say it, he said to himself. George, the dragon you're about to slay is more interested in buttercups than battles, so you have to call off the fight, okay? Okay. While he waited for the knight's return, the lad looked around at the transformed study where the ongoing chess game had been. On top of the chessboard lay the scroll with the official orders from the king. Above, a stack of books on George's wall hung the dusty, faded tapestry. Kenny approached it and, after blowing off a layer of dust, could now see that it was embroidered with a knight piercing a dragon in the heart. Finally, his eyes fell to the polished shield with the dragon etched on it. The image was beastly. The wicked drake had fire blaring from its mouth and nose. It was nothing at all like Graham, who just the other night had used his fire breath to light his dad's pipe by blowing a tiny spark out of his left nostril. However, like Kenny's frying pan from his first not visit with the dragon, George's shield was blotched with scorch marks and real scorch marks made from fiery breath. George dashed back into the study. I knew this was here somewhere. I just had to dig around a bit. He cleared his table of the chessboard and the scroll and slapped down a large brown roll of parchment. It's a map of the area, he said, beaming, and I would like to discuss strategy with you, Kenny. You know Shepherd's Hill like the back of your paw, so how do you think we should best make our approach? George sat, eagerly awaiting the lad's response. Kenny had never seen him so vibrant, so alive before. 
This wasn't going to be easy to do, but he had to do it. Um, I can't help you, George, he said. There, he thought to himself, that wasn't hard. Keep going. You see, he continued aloud, there is um, something very important I've been meaning to tell you about the dragon. Sensing that something was once again amiss, the knight put a large arm around the young rabbit and spoke softly. Spit it out, lad. What is it? What's troubling you? Are you afraid of it? Not really, Kenny replied, furrowing his brow a bit. Because it's... Uh, because it's okay if you are, said George. No, really, I'm not, Kenny said, setting his bottle down, that fiery feeling flickering in his stomach. You see, you are so brave, young squire. Charlotte told me it was a si it was sighted very close to your house, and I know your family's in danger. No, Kenny yelled. The fire in his stomach completely overtook him, burning away the river stone. That's not it at all. Just listen to me. You don't understand anything. Graham is a good dragon, a peaceful dragon. He doesn't like to fight. He's never fought a day in his life, but his brothers did, and they were all killed by knights. Knights just like you, and now you have orders from the king to kill him, and the stupid king doesn't even know him. You don't even know him. Do you know what he likes to do? George was blinking at the boy. His mouth was slightly agar open. He likes painting sunsets, listening to classical music, playing piano, reading, and creme brulee. He's, he's, the boy could no longer keep the river down and it started trickling out, burning his eyes. He's my best friend and I don't want to lose either of you in some dumb fight to the death. With his mouth still agape, George studied the boy, watching him wipe his eyes with the sleeve of his shirt. Sniffling, Kenny got up to leave and turned back to the old man. You said, a friend of yours is a friend of mine. Of all the people in the world who could have helped me and Graham, I thought of you. You two are the only ones who really understand me. Kenny stood in the doorway, looking the old knight in the eyes. I even thought you two might just become friends. With that, the boy ran down the stairs and out the front door and into the gas-lit streets towards home.